Hey all you happy lost souls, how y'all doing out there? Um, this video is going to be kind of um, a little bit more specific and uh, kind of neat. We're going to dig a little deeper and a little older into this story. The reason I'm making this video now is because some of these artifacts are kind of on loan. Um, it may be the only time I have them in my possession because my friend and partner in all of this uh, exploration and, and creek walking, um, my friend Dina, she's just going away, um, adventuring across country for a little while. So um, as you can see, I'm keeping a lot of her uh, <laughs> her stuff while, until she gets back. Um, she's a, a true traveler. you know. Uh, but anyway, um, let's get into this really cool stuff. And, and the reason I really launched that one video that has got the most views and kind of, you know, got people interested in the channel a little bit was the North American Neanderthal. It sounds very catchy. Now, I named it that because of this one trip about seven, eight years ago and went to a place in the Penny Pack um, where the creek divides um, and starts flowing down towards Philly and the other branch starts heading back up towards Hapero. Now, the branch that heads back up towards Hapero looks as though it was a man-made cut, a straight cut. It almost looks like um, a canal. Um, and this is probably to irrigate um, the colonial fields or to redirect it for all the colonial grist mills you know, that were along the penny pack. Or it could have even been an older thing by Native Americans, um, slightly later Native Americans who were farming and um, using those fields, and they could have redirected the stream for just simply for irrigation. Well, the long and short of it is when this unnatural cut was put in either for the bridge or for the irrigation, what happened is the original part of the stream is not, not taking that, that course anymore, and it dried out. So you have this essentially little island with the current creek splitting in front of it, where the old creek ran behind it. And the spot that ran behind it is just this perfectly dried out riverbed with access to a, a giant wall or deposit of, of mud and dirt and, and layers all the way down to bedrock. And this, this wall went a good, I want to say, 18 to 20 feet high, this bank. And we're in the creek bed along the bottom, and if you know what a cicada killer is, like a giant bee that, that, that hunt those little chirping cicadas in the trees. Well, they had their little nests all in this, this bank and this mud wall, so the bees were constantly, big bees were constantly annoying us. But I was actually fishing. There's a really deep hole back there, some native trout and whatnot. And my friend who was like, yo, you got to see this stuff, because... At that time, we had been artifact hunting, but we weren't super serious, and we started finding a lot of things like in these areas, and we're like, "This is, something's going on. It's too much pattern going on." Well, it was when she approached me and she found this artifact, this artifact. I went over to the wall and started looking in the same area where she pulled these two out, and right next to it, I pulled these out, this out, this out. And I found this later in the day, left almost on the bank, but I believe it's from around the same time period as these other ones. Now, what's super interesting is these two. I've showed you this one in past videos, and we can see, you see the shine on that? that that's obsidian, snowflake obsidian. Um, you see the edge work, the percussion working. Um, this is, is essentially a Stone Age uh, X-Acto knife. The edge is right there, so razor sharp. And then you flip it around, you got another cutting edge, and you got another th thumb grip here and here. These tools are made by, um, in the same material and in same style as Neanderthal tools, with this percussion flaking, stuff you see 60 to 100 and some thousand years ago in, in, in Neanderthal sites and in kill sites. Now these really interesting projectile point, we'll call it the point of these unknown makers. Maybe um, Denisovan, certainly back from that time period. So we look at this harpoon-like spearhead. It's very big. It's very big, but it's very thin, and it, it's designed with with f precision. And this style, this this harpoon, this almost like tooth root design. You see it here too. Another root coming down where the edge chipped off here. 
and you see it in this the silver um, spearhead FUG, the same pattern. You see it in another pattern. And and what they did is this is super thin and it's still it's pressure flake on the edges. It's still very very sharp, and it's actually fluted or scaled down. You see here how thin it is. We'll see. We'll look at it from this direction. See how thin it is, and then it gets thicker towards the point. So you have a stopping point for whatever composite stick or the shaft you're putting in it, and then it's fluted on the top, right in this section. So you could feel with your fingers where that shaft sat, but it's the harpoon-like shape. This design, you know, you've got the Salutrian stuff that's extremely diamond-like, um, very thin, but you don't see the fluting aspect. Um, these, you have the fluting which looks more fulsome in design than it does Clovis, if anything, because of how far the, the fluting goes up towards the point. Um, this is is different. So this has a tooth design, and, and part of the edge chipped off, but it's been flaked on the edge. It's still super sharp, and it's some kind of metal. It's been superheated. This is a heat treated. It's got a lot of iron ore in it. It does all kinds of things on the reader. Um, so this is heated. They're using some kind of heat treatment. But this one... This tool, which I didn't even get into yet, I'll show you in a second, are super old. So say like 60,000 to, to 100,000 years old. And this is what I said. There's, there's some group of people here before the, Dan before the um, Solutrean stuff started showing up, the 20,000 year layers. There's this other group here, and I think they were still active and, and I'll hear when, when these guys showed up and I don't think they really fought it. I think they probably got along. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of conflict or anything. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of production and a, and a lot of, um, in the 20,000 year layer, there's, there's a lot more, you know, complacency and being stationary. They possibly could have even gotten into, you know, starting even at that point before the disaster happened. In the 13,000 layer, they were farming. They might have already been, agriculture might have, you know, been going on that far back. But this, look at this. Look at this hand blade. Look at this obsidian hand blade. Look at it. Look at the patina. Look at the shine on it still. Look at the fracture. Now, this is a little bit later. So the Neanderthals be percussion flaked obsidian or flint usually with this, you know, super sharp. These edges are hundreds of times sharper than razors and steel. Look at the beautiful pressure flaking though on the edges to make it even razor sharp. And then you see that percussion. You see how there's that spider webbing from where they hit it with a hammer-like instrument. So and you got this perfectly fractured core here with this flat piece to grip and you put all that leverage on that outside edge so my thumb can go here and I got an edge all the way around and I also have another edge here that's pressure flaked and this is for butchering and going through really tough hide and getting meat off a of bone and, and um, this was found right with another one that's very similar material just a little bit darker just I showed you that a second ago and it was found with these and also found with these. Now, I'm not a paleontologist. I don't know about fossilized bones, but these are fossilized bones or tusks of something that have been cut, butchered, and broken. This looks like a vertebrae. Um, but they're stone, and, you know, fossil bones don't turn to stone. It'll take at least ten to 15,000 years for that to happen at the earliest end. Um, so we got this bone that has been, you know, morphed and turned into rock that almost looks like it could have been burnt first before it turned into a rock. It's still got some of this, you know, yeah, just very, um, like, you could, you could see that it's, it's a bone, but it, it's not, yeah, I don't know of what, it's, uh, not my field of study. That's, you gotta know what you're doing. And, you know, so people look at this, oh, this came off of, um, an ancient, uh, you know, woolly rhino or you know or giant boar or something or you know ground sloth giant ground sloth who the fuck knows you know, they're hunting all kinds of things but this is fascinating because this design it just doesn't show up it's got both that harpoon shape and it's fluted this is not clovis 
like I said, the only other one that shows up in the Stone Age record was, was found over near Egypt. And it dates to 6,900,000 years old, at the earliest, 50 to 40,000 years old. But it's interesting that it's harpoon like in design or in shape. It's a very effective point for going into something and coming out of it. Very aerodynamic. And we, we don't see it just once. We see that same tooth like design being repeated, but not very often. And only in these extremely old layers. But this, like I said, this wasn't found over in some cave in, in, in Germany or in Greece or, you know, in Africa. This was found in a layer in southeast Pennsylvania, about 10, 11 miles from the city of Philadelphia. And these are extremely old percussion and also pressure flaking. But you see this obvious Neanderthal-like material, that obsidian, that volcanic glass, which is not a material that you just find around here. It has to be down, deep, deep down. You can find some of it, but for them to be working with it and having access to the material locally around here, it would have had to have been thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago to have easy access because the stuff is buried under tons of deposit of time now and uh, you know i haven't explored every single area and every single deposit there could be a source for this nearby that i'm just not sure of and i have to find or this could have been a traveling group of hunter and gatherers who built these tools elsewhere and, and traveled a long way and, and left them here um so we can call them north american Neanderthal, but it's more apt to call them denisovans because they were a group that ran parallel with the Neanderthals, but their DNA seems to be more dispersed in the North Americas uh, around um, the heritage of the people from the Great Lakes, um, even um, tons of people down in the South American tribes, um, Australia. These all have Denisovan um, ancient roots, so obviously travelers, um, Euro-Asian, Asian, all these have strong Denisovan roots, and we see it still in... Um, Modern Native American DNA, a strong presence of Denisovan DNA markers show up, but mainly with tribal groups of the north and around the Great Lakes. And um, the fact is a lot of tribes have been obliterated or wiped out in their entirety, and, and there's no living members left. There's, there's not much further testing that can be done. But the Denisovans' oldest DNA lineage goes back to Australia. The Aborigines have the strongest marker of it. And some ancient, ancient people, um, I don't think they got wiped out. I think they were just assimilated into us. Um, I think they were very tall. I think they were much more muscular than us. I think they knew how to work with stone, precision. Uh, I think they would have got along if they ever ran into the smaller, slighter, but equally adept um, Salutrians and the Salutrian hypothesis is most definitely holding merit over these layers um, because uh, who else could they be because apparently nobody else was here until the Clovis culture appeared some you know in the archaeological record 11,000 BCE 13,000 years ago and that was just a reboot guys it, oh when that when that comet hit, you're just seeing the reboot of the Clovis culture starting back up after everything was wiped out. But thousands of years prior, you had Salutrians, and then thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years before that, you have Chert layer, and then after this Chert layer, you start finding these bizarre, out of place looking tools for Pennsylvania. Um, this is uh, what fueled the whole channel finding this piece this piece, this piece, and this piece. That day changed everything. And also finding what we ascertain are bones. I, I honestly need to get those checked. I just you know that they don't look like rock and they look like bone, fossilized bone to me. Um, they have all the characteristics of it. Like you could see the marrow underneath of the, you know, the, the other stripped layer. It's fossilized in a rock now, but you know, at one point it was bone. So this, um, it's just absolutely crazy. 
these these pieces. This is pressure flaked all the way around, both percussion and pressure flaked, which the pressure flaking Neanderthal is not as known for as much, but became known for older down the road. Now, the Denisovans are much like the Neanderthal. This could be their technology, and they just use very similar methods, percussion and pressure flaking. But this, for all you... Um, you people that need your eyes checked or you people that just want to make trolling comments about, uh, you know, everything just being naturally formed. Well, yeah, all the rocks here are pretty much naturally formed, but almost every one of these was altered by human hand for a purpose. Um, because nature makes the rocks come out like this each time in that, that perfect shape and design just because it feels like doing it. No, they're, they're hooks. They're some kind of function. Now, oddly enough, um, these look a lot like rune stones, um, but I don't think that's what they are. I just believe the shapes are very similar to certain runes, but I believe these are functional because of where they're found. And they're found in association with other L-shaped objects and hook-like instruments. This is very clearly a hook. You know, and when it's sharpened on all sides, it could be tied in the middle, it could be baited on all four ends, it's got a hook. It, it could have just been shaped like a fish, it could have been a lure. Um, we just don't know. These things seem to be more tools. They, they, they don't seem to be left as like FUG, but they're very thin. They're very much in the design and material of the Salutrian style. Not this much older style in the 50,000 layers, at least. Um, this North American, if you would, Neanderthal, for lack of a better term, style tool. Now, when I found those two, I was just as surprised because it felt extremely out of place, but I had never been to a spot in the creek where I had access to such old material that was intact, that wasn't just washed up in a gravel bar, you know, uh, being recycled like a washing machine every time it rained. But um, I just wanted to really uh, get the opportunity to show you these tools that I've only ever had the pictures of before because they're in my... Um, custody at the moment so uh, this one in particular just it just blows my mind because the edge work how thin it is how strong it is still that it's this crazy material that's similar to this um, paleogorskite type material um, I guess I want one of these trays but I'm sure let's see here I don't know if it's in one of these yeah it's in one of these I know it's in one of them Shiny tray. I don't know where I put the paleo uh, griskite clay at. That piece is around, but it's similar to that material. It's like an amalgamation of different crystals. Um, it's like a lot of quartz, really. Um, some iron agates. This is like a. Um, a schist, but with extremely high iron content in it. Yeah. Feldspar schist, but like other micas and feldspars that snap right in half, this thing is rock hard and still razor sharp and still has its form. And it's actually fluted or formed. It has, a, has that indentation right there to sit down into that shaft, and then it stops right about there. So that's all an indentation that's all been fluted out. So it you know, it can sit in the shaft at a better angle. Um, these are only on those older layers, you know, down underneath it, all this other stuff. Uh, but, yeah, a lot, really tired of the trolls saying that, like, you know, nature forms all these, like, these things and these shapes on its own. Maybe a one-off, sure. If you're in a place where everything just looks like normal, geological rock and information and, and you see one long stone or something mixed in and you can't really put anything to it. But when you come to a beach and you see all these other tools in conjunction with all these preforms and you these these are like five or six of these long tools that I took when I can tell you that there's probably hundreds of thousands of them throughout these deposits. These longer tools. Um, this is a giant operation uh a lot was going on through certain periods of time. And um, 
is was a influence that is in efficacy identical to the solution. Now here's a, a wonderful solution in preform. Arrows are generally longer like this. They're very triangular. This is not done yet, but you can see that's been edged out here, edged out here. You got this perfectly thin agate. All they would have to do is pressure flake the sides, corners, and this is so thin and so strong, you don't really need to flute it. It'll just sit right down into, into any kind of split or any kind of shaft design that, that you have. Um, and we don't have many of these, these thinner, um, these thinner preforms. You do have some of them. Um, but honestly, I could find a bunch more of them if I, if I looked for them. Um, this stuff is, is all over. Like I said, it's not like hard to find, not in, in the spots that I go to, to, to find these. And the thing is, it's three separate creeks here. You're, you're looking at everything I'm showing you right now and explaining and talking about is all found in the penny pack. But you get tools like this, these longer, these, these sewing type tools. You find a lot of them in the, in the chamonix and this basalt like uh, material. These are a lot of chamonix artifacts up here. But then you have penny pack, penny pack. This is found in a um, plow field right above in a chamonix. So you got um, in situ, you know, projectile points from, from a woodland period, paleo woodland period. Um, and that's what the 17 to 20,000 year period is. We'll call it the paleo Indian paleo woodland period um, was supposed to occur uh, after, like, like right in that, before that, like, transition period. And you got the woodland, which is much sooner, but paleo woodland is, is much older. You're into that Clovis, older layer than Clovis into that solution idea. Now, these people are no different, you know, to get some really odd shapes, like a boat keel. That almost looks like the, the boat keel of a Saxon boat, like a long boat. <laughs> it's crazy. Now you get more solution scrapers like this. You can see the artifact patina on the back, all that black stuff from where it was gripped, from where it was held, and then you can still see the edge and this edge and this edge here, the sharp edge, this is a hide scraper. A lot of these are hide scrapers. Um, it's like not, not, not hard to find those. They're pretty much everywhere. Um, so very salutrian. All these kind of salutrian knives that have been heat treated that are super sharp still that are unifacially flaked, like flaked on one side but not the other. Another salutrian knife design. It's probably an animal effigy again. You're getting that like same, same shape of animal, you know, portrayed in, in, in the tools. I'm just showing you guys efficacy and pattern. Um, and like you get into periods of time where you could still see the ochre staining and the pitch that they, they made this red, black, and white with um, the colors of war. Um, and we find this on a lot of artifacts, like like down here. The spearhead is covered in red on the one side, white on the other. This um, war kelt here, you know, you got your notch there, um, and you got this white, red, and black staining all over it. This this war paint, um, and you know, you find that in the this stuff from, I would say. 500 to 1000 BCE to 1000 AD, that period, there's just a lot of conflict in the archaeology then. There's a lot of warfare going on, all the way up through the Beaver Wars and through the 1600s and all that stuff. But Anyway, guys, um, please subscribe if you're new to the channel. Thank you for finding the channel and subscribing. Um, it's fine if you disagree with anything. Feel free to post your opinions or your comments. I don't really do a good job at looking at them anyway or responding that often. If you are really serious and love this stuff and, and want to share or collaborate um, on a deeper level or something like that, you can reach out to me on um, Instagram at uh, Happy Lost Souls 27 is the handle for Instagram. But please um, like, comment, subscribe, turn on the notifications. If you hate it and I waste your time, I'm sorry, then, then don't, obviously. Um, and um, you shouldn't have been watching this long anyway if you didn't like it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm tired of, uh, of this simple um, comment or this simple 
the notion that everything you see here is naturally occurring. I agree with that actually. Like all this stone is pretty much naturally occurring. What I don't agree with is saying that none of these were influenced by man or artifact. Like if you can't look at that and see that that is an arrowhead, then you seriously are in need of medical help because your eyes suck and I feel bad for you. Uh, anyways, um, to all you paradigm police, naysayers, haters, um, uh, all you close-minded folk, um, y'all can can fuck off, um, <laughs> for lack of better terms, um, because mm, I don't need the closed-minded opinions. Who wants to, to walk into a closed door? Um, obviously, all this stuff has to be open to speculation, interpretation, and redating, uh, rediscovery. Uh, uh, North America has done the greatest job at being horrible in archaeology. Um, by toting a stupid narrative for, I don't know, ever since they discovered Clovis points in Clovis, New Mexico, and they're like, oh, nothing else is there, it's the oldest thing, yeah. it's okay that, you know, just outside of Nevada, you know, you know, in the deserts, you know, near Death Valley, it's okay that we just found, you know, 14 to 17,000 year old human footprints that have just magically been preserved in the seamless environment. The vacuum-like environment of the desert. People, archaeology is not a science. Say this again. There are scientific compartments within archaeology. There's endocrinology, there's tree ring dating, there's um, soil, uh, archaeological, bioarchaeological, um, experimental archaeological. These all use scientific method. They all use scientific method to understand evidence or clues that they dug out of the ground. Problem is, we don't know how old civilization is. We keep finding new ones every year. We don't know how old we are. We don't know if there were advanced civilizations of things that weren't human. Imagine a lizard evolving um, into superior intelligence, um, being able to manipulate its environment um, five million, six million years ago, uh, you know, after the dinosaurs, but before us, when there is another period of inhabitable life all across the whole earth. Um, if you're going to say that modern human has only been around at, at the, at the longest 300 to 500,000 years old and, and the only relative, the oldest relative of human at a million years old, that's nothing. That's less than a, a second in, in our geological record when you're considering the Earth is 4.2 billion years old. Some odd change. It's nothing. Um, they find crazy artifacts that can't be explained that look technologically advanced, frozen in coal. Um, different coal mines, they have found collapsed chariots fossilized. Coal takes like 500 million years, okay? 500 million years to form deposits. The stuff embedded inside of that had to be that old for that coal to form around it and for that stuff to be stuck in the coal. Um, there is so much stuff we don't know about. Uh, so much stuff that's suppressed and just so much stuff we haven't found yet. And I'm passionate about this because we're not doing a good job of looking. This shit is right under our noses. It's right there. It's, it's plain to see it's everywhere. Problem is we want to go back to the log back to the written information. And I've done all that. I've done all my homework an anthropologically. Research the oldest known written um, descriptions left behind by the first settlers along that creek, which were Dutch. Read the first transcripts of anybody that made contact, which were Dutch and French, probably in the 1570s to 1600 time frame. That's how long ago that you know they were here. They were here prior to the uh, the English, um, and they were in areas like uh, it's called Arcadia now. The French called it Acadia. There's even a college down there near Philadelphia. That's right near Valley Green, and that's where rumors of gold mines and silver happen. Even though it's really all in a penny pack, the creeks share each other. Like feeder streams run between the two. Geology is super similar, but you get a lot more schist down, uh, stuff like this down in the Wissahickon, which is a, 
wonderful material because it could be cut in both directions and not fractured. It's great for building stuff, for heat treating, for, for making bricks. Most of the houses, my house is made out of this stuff. I was quarried all over the place. That, however, is an ancient hammer. Um, obviously, nature did not make that perfect hammer um, and then throw it in a fire and heat it up and make all the iron ore solidify in it. Um, that was obviously a bashing tool or the work is either a weapon or a tool made by some ancient people. Um, maybe Native American, maybe a way, way older group before before the Native American population came came into that. I don't even know what you want to call it. They could have all been the same people just traveling from different directions and getting here at different times. I'm just saying um, the people hunting the seals came over and they even left seals in their artwork um, you know, jumping out of out of the ocean, you know, carved in this heavy, you know, tin laden material. Um, so you have these beautiful side effigies, these animal like carvings. We see a lot of that in this solution layer, but then this crazy older layer of the unknown makers, the maker of these harpoons and these Neanderthal like tools. But why is it in PA? Because somebody that made that stuff. 60 to 100,000 years ago was. And um, they killed something and butchered it and, and left behind some tools and some, some bones, some evidence. Well, it's all up in the air, open to speculation. Um, but uh, I don't know if you would find stuff like this any further north. In, 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 in age I mean maybe up in New York a little bit certain areas that, that where the ice was, was spotty but a lot of places north of northern PA during that last ice age were under a couple miles of ice um, now this stuff could be way way older so this stuff's 150,000 to 60,000 years ago like that old you would find it up there because the ice wasn't there then um, so you know um it, the ice, the ice sheets and where they're at might help us figure out some of this stuff. The problem is ice moves stuff too. This stuff may have been way up north under an ice sheet and then got pushed down, but this was found intact. It wasn't in some gravel pit. wasn't. So we know that this is really, really old because I know certain layers when I'm looking at them because of the materials in them. So we can find one layer. I can see Victorian pottery, and I know it's from about the 1800s to 1910 you know, 1910 in that area, from about 1850 to 1910, this material. I can go down a couple other layers. I'm finding, you know, farming equipment, tools, stuff that goes back, you know, in, into meso, um, into, like, woodland period, uh, stem shouldered arrow points, typical... Native American in style style stuff and then you don't see a lot of that stuff though in the layer you see most of the stuff in is that 20,000 17,000 year layer of right before Clovis culture appeared right before the comet came a couple thousand years yes we see all these this workshop where there's mass production of stuff going on trust me the people here in more modern times, they, they were killing each other too quick. They couldn't be in one place that long, creating an entire operation. That, and it's in none of the re written record. This stuff is way older. But it's everywhere. Remember, this stuff's all coming from only about five or six different banks. And stuff's there. Tons of it are there. It rain, every time it rains, there's billions more stuff is pushed up the surface. Tons of stuff. I mean, it's astronomical, the amount of activity that we have no idea of because we just said it never happened. <laughs> Instead of looking at all this stuff from a train perspective and, and, and seeing, obviously, there's layers of efficacy, there's layers of design, and um, there's obviously manipulation um, and, and tool design. Uh, that, again, these, these type tools here, these are found similar exact shaped artifacts, the same type of patina on them, are found in Neanderthal sites. So uh, there's this commonality in this age, and, and like I said, the North American Neanderthal. Well, I got, I've got i been rambling on too far, too long, and like I said, please subscribe, stay happy, stay lost, you know, and put your soul in everything that you do, and please subscribe, and uh, I love you all, and uh, keep on searching. You know, if you live in the United States, and you have some streams with 
some funny sounding names, some Native American folklore behind them. Just go look in them. Go check the places where the hill cane is growing. Go check the places where there's natural hemp and, and there's an old Baptist church that was probably supplanted there a long time ago to, to cover up spiritual practices of, of a, you know, an older tradition. And um, that, that's always what happens when one belief system comes in and tries to put its important stuff right over the top of another person's important stuff. Uh, but this stuff's in pretty much every gravel bar. Um, if you look hard enough in creeks around here, um, you'll find it everywhere. Um, happy hunting, guys. Uh, and um, please subscribe and let's find... Let's find how old this uh, this mystery goes in, in North America.